the somewhat difficult task of doing two things at once, uh, which are somewhat at cross purposes, as two things often are. One is I need to give a self-contained lecture uh, here. The second one is I'm also starting a class. Um, and so I have tried to design this thing um, that it can actually function as a class, but also um, give a sense of finality for folks who aren't doing the class. Um, and I can see, uh, as I sort of review this business last night, right in the square or out of where Gramsci used to live uh, there, um, that I probably bit off more than I can intelligently chew, so I can, or you can chew, so I'll uh, sort of try to keep things cut down to bite size. But I would like, if I could, may I quickly find out a bit about you? Like, where are you folks from? Um, how many are from Europe? Okay, and then, all right, now, Africa or Asia? So we don't, we have, so we had some Africans and some Europeans. I don't think we got quite everybody in there, which I, I know you're not from Greenland. But what I'm really thinking about is if I'm going to do examples in the course, I try to fit them. So we have a huge problem with uh, the type of material that I'm going to try to teach, which is about the intersection of politics and economics. It's that most of the stuff is written by uh, either folks in America or in Britain by America, I mean the United States. That's a huge problem. Um, it's a sort of classic, almost colonial bias uh, when you sort of start to generalize it in a uh, social science setting. And about the only thing I can offer on this is, well, I've thought a lot about how you would change the, what happens to these views if you change the institutional context. Um, so that I'm hoping we just, you won't just feel that you're learning about the American or the British system because you're not, um, or so I hope. Anyway, um, I, what, I, what I want to do is basically this. Um, for a long time, I've been very unhappy with the uh, social science writing in Europe. I, I, you will not be surprised to learn that I'm probably equally discontented with the social science writing in the US and Britain, but it's not counting now Britain as half of Europe. Um, and, uh, but the problem in the European context has really gotten acute, and I think you know why. It's because of the Euro crisis. Uh, the thing that astonishes me about the Euro crisis is that if you just step back and take a look, you can do the Euro crisis in one minute. It's that there was a total collapse of the banking system in 2008, though the, Euro the European uh, a part of it started actually collapsing in 2007. It was ahead of the American collapse. Um, and then it was rescued by massive state support. Uh, I mean, in the middle of the celebration of free market economics and, the, and claims about how everything would be better if you got the state out of everything, uh, except maybe policing in the army, um, the state stepped in on a scale it never had before. Um, and in the end, what happened was that in virtually every country, the, the debts of the banking system were taken over by the state. That, and, and that's basically, ever since this, um, people have been then yapping about, gee, there are all these heavily indebted uh, states. Isn't it terrible that they have such high debts? And you have this discussion, for example, in Greece, uh, which suggests that somehow uh, you know, the Greek population was living high. Well, in, in truth, a lot of the Greek debts were run up for the Olympics ahead of them, uh, which was a sort of European or even worldwide uh, event. And Greece, like everybody else, had a bailouts banks and got stuck. Uh, and the response of the European community in the case of the Greeks is a separate problem we can discuss. It. But my big point is this. It's like, where's the discussion in politics and economics of how exactly did the banking system turn this trick, right? Uh, and you know, how come there's been people, the, the bulk of the uh, discussion on the euro crisis talks about, it's usually when you look at it, relative unit labor costs, which uh, my friend Service Storm uh, has, I think, shown in detail. Now, that's not what 
uh, has been the problem. And, and so what I want to talk about is the how maybe how better can one think about the relationship between politics and economics, and particularly between political parties uh, and the state and, and economies. I mean, how do you actually understand what goes on in modern day economies? I would note too that when you actually look at the empirical literature, it's not just that the public discussions in the journals, and the pavement, pardon me, in the papers uh, are empty, basically, just empty, pretty much. Um, it's that the social scientists haven't got much to say. There is this long-running discussion about the democratic deficit in the European Union. And I actually think the German sociologists, are, uh, Wolfgang Street or Fritz Schaaf, for example, are pretty good on that stuff. They, they have no difficulty showing you that the population is getting increasingly disgusted uh, with what it sees and that uh, the, the, the European Union has currently constituted uh, is basically a shell of a democracy. It's anything but that uh, in practice. And, and you know, as usual, um, in the social sciences, what you find most people debating stuff like that. Well, that leaves the question, is there a democratic deficit or not? You know, at this point in 2015, I think you have to be simply on another planet if you can't see that there's a serious problem uh, with a democratic deficit. Um, but yeah, there's no really positive analysis uh, of what goes on between political parties. How do you model, how, should, how do you, what's, what's the model of elections, basically? I mean, if, if the population can control them, how, how, how come they don't know? Uh, and why does everything seem to be going so completely off kilter over and over and over again? That's my topic, okay? Then to get to my topic of the press and black holes, uh, essentially what I want to argue to you is I'm just going to try to replace the model of party competition that everybody walks around with in their head. And I'm going to try, I will do this very briefly and summarily today. But the first thing we will do, I mean, I'm sure nobody's read the stuff I just put up overnight uh, on the, um, the readings for the course. They're up there, and you can look at that. And I have to say, I have this problem. The first reading uh, is the worst. It's in terms of how to, it's like the great Gobi Desert, uh, trying to go across it with hardly any supply of water. It's almost unintelligible, I admit that. It is, however, a very famous article. And it's, uh, it's by Anthony Downs. Um, and uh, what I will do next time is sort of deconstruct it in detail. I mean, I actually think, uh, though this course deals a lot with politics and economics, you don't need to know very much economics to live successfully. Uh, and happily in it. I, I've tried to design this thing so you don't need a lot uh, beyond the uh, sort of self-containment uh, that's, that's sitting there in the reads. Anyway, um, so I want to walk rapidly through the basic argument first of how does, how, what's the model that everybody walks around with in their head as for how the population controls the state? And it's basically a version of the Downs uh, argument. And then what I'm going to do is lay out, again, rather summarily, a completely alternative approach. Now, not surprisingly, that happens to be mine. <laughs> I've written around it for a long time. Um, in which money drives the system. And I want to show you how, once you get, if you change a couple of assumptions in the way, in the way that the mechanism is supposed to work, you get a radically different view of what's going on in the system. Now, in, in terms of doing something in detail, I suspect that's, we won't get a whole lot more than that done uh, today, because I want to told I should end by about one o'clock, which seems to be two hours strikes me in a long time. I mean, this is not Nuremberg, uh, and you're not supposed to just sort of sit cheering through stuff. Moreover, I should say, if you get lost, raise your hand. Nothing terrible is going to happen. I don't, I don't mind repeating uh, points and often it may be a defect in my presentation. I mean, I would, we're not going to give people medals for sitting through stuff they can't understand, so just stop me. Uh, I mean, all for sure, anything that's on your mind is almost for sure on the minds of other students. They're just too, too reluctant to uh, say anything. 
Um, anyway, so let me just, so the, the first part is thus to look at downs, the, and which is basically your everyday intuition about how democracies work. The second one is to look at a sort of general approach to money and politics. And I'll show you how that uh, changes drastically how, the, how you think the system works. Now that begs the question, okay, if you decide money's important, then what happens? And I can outline that for you just briefly how you go about that. It will not maybe turn out to be too surprising um, that the, uh, it's going to turn out to be a lot, a lot of the deep, specific institutional details of the economy matter. And then for the interface between politics and economics, an awful lot depends on the specific rules that people have. I mean, for example, some states regulate campaign contributions a lot. Other states, my own, for example, <laughs> don't really don't regulate them at all anymore, except to require an increasingly small number of more disclosure. Um, in any case, though, I think you'll find in these systems that one way or another, the relevant sums of money get delivered. But that's a problem, as I'll show you some ways about that. Uh, later when I start talking about the spectrum of political money. Anyway, and I'll, I'll just, at the end of today, I'll briefly apply this to the press, but I don't see how uh, we'll actually get there. I think it, uh, trying to do everything in one giant gulp is, is too much. Um, so, I, I, and I think my, my topic, why party competition doesn't work, the political party competition doesn't work the way uh, you're so commonly told is sufficiently important and interesting you probably won't you know, hopefully be bored to death. Um, so uh, let me get started. Um, the, uh, let, me, let me try to do this sort of straightforwardly, sort of completely non-technically, then we'll look uh, at details. When you start looking at people's theory of democracy, all right, it's usually elections. I know when I was a young person in the United States, they used to tell us the big difference between um, America and Russia was that we have elections and they don't uh, in Russia. And it's true, in Russia, they didn't. Well, they had them, but no one thought they were competitive. You know, if you get beyond the mere presence of election, though, you will wonder more and more when you see whole countries, and indeed whole continents, Europe being that continent right now, where you know the population hates what they're getting in the way of uh, economic policy, for example, uh, and would do almost anything to change it. Um, you want to ask, uh, can you tell us more? There must be something besides just the form of elections here that work. Uh, this is, I think, real clear in parts of the developing world, where folks have elections a fair amount of the time, and there people will admit outside those places that those are shams. They get rather more incensed if you say that elections in a place like the United States, well, they're not shams. I'll give you an account that by the time we're done with this course, where you will see they are not shams. Neither, however, do they work at all like they are supposed to, to guarantee, if you like, the popular uh, democratic will actually happens. Uh, and I'll show you that. I, I can just give you, we can do this sort of almost like a little mechanism, uh, an alternative solar system, if you like, in which, uh, in fact, the planets move around the sun uh, and not around the Earth. Um, anyway, um, all right, so when, when people talk about this, they usually have in mind a sort of, what I, the sort of classical political model of eh, John Locke and really especially John Stuart Mill. And provided we don't look at this too rigorously, it runs basically this. The population sort of, you, you get these parties, they compete. They put up candidates. Um, and then you sort of pick between the candidates, right? Since they've got to get your vote to win, they're, they must therefore offer you something, uh, they gotta give you a policy package that you basically like. And you're gonna, if you vote for uh, the, the candidate closest to your views, runs the argument. This is a mechanism, right? That's the mechanism. It's the, the sort of vote, uh, there, and you can see implicitly there is a, an assumption, you vote for the candidate who's closest to your position. That you'll soon learn to call this the distance rule, 
uh, in a minute. Um, and I mean, I'm going to talk about what is called spatial modeling in the social sciences. Um, that's not outer space, it's political space. And uh, every, this is typically treated as an extremely difficult and abstract thing. Actually, anybody can learn to do it in a hurry. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, and, I, and I've spent, obviously, some time thinking about how to present this stuff uh, in a sort of straightforward way. So I will try it. Anyway, um, let me sort of start up here. Suppose uh, we begin. Is that a hand or no? Just, okay. um, I want to just lay out what you need. Now, you can actually go on and on about these assumptions. I'm going to do a very simple, uh, non technical version. The first thing we're going to do, ah, uh, yes, okay, is we will have one issue. Uh, we're going to have the pop we're going to imagine the population here uh, actually having to vote on just one issue, and I'm going to make it really stupid uh, and clear, just just for clarity. Okay, my favorite issue on this is just as an example, uh, how much of the na nation's gross domestic product out of all the economic resources available, would you like to spend on defense? I understand in Europe this problem is dealt with much more uh, straightforwardly. The answer is not very much, uh, and that's that. In the US, this is a really big deal, and it is bitterly fought between the political parts. Anyway, but we're going to have just that one issue, OK? Uh, and, and I don't like that. Um, no, no, no. What am it I has doing? to be back. What's, what's that? Uh, the, the it has to be eraser back. Ah, okay. No, not there. No. Oh, in the center. <laughs> all right, all right. Close the loop, I guess. All right. So the first one then is one issue, um, and we're going to have we're going to impose the distance rule on voters. That is to say, you have to vote for the person that's nearest your position. See, what I'm doing is building a little model of an electoral universe. This may seem stupid. It's not. Watch how it moves uh, a little bit. Anyway, so the distance rule, which is uh, vote for the nearest candidate nearest you. Uh, I can see that's no help. Uh, my defense of this is if you want art, go to the Pinacotech out in Milan or something. But uh, let's just say candidate. That will perhaps help things. Okay, so we get a distance. So you're going to vote for the candidate. Now we're going to have just two parties. And you're going to want to ask me. What happens if there are three, four, or five? We'll see. Uh, but right now, give me the, just the, the sort of two issue. Um, then we will drop in this little assumption, which is that everybody knows all the, has all the information and understands the issue. That is to say, there's not folks walking around thinking, no, the problem is not defense policy, it's Morals, public morals are decaying. We'll, we'll get to public morals, but in Europe, four follows three. What's that? In Europe, four in, in follows anyway. three. Four follows three. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. What's your question? Yeah, it was of course in Arabia, just for the point. But again, I take the point. Thank you. Yes. Now, where were we? Um, Perfect info. Info. Okay, so we've got now. Uh, that that means you want nobody's fooled. There's another way of putting this: is that nobody's fooled. Uh, and you're going to say that's obviously crazy. It is crazy. But if you stick with this, you get a really interesting result when you start to imagine a system with money. 
because uh, what I'm going to work, work up to the point of showing you, once you put money into the system, you actually could run the system, lose, everybody can never get what they want under some conditions, and they're not fooled, which is an amazing you know, result. It's quite counterintuitive. I mean, huge numbers of people walk around all day um, with that. And we have to impose, there is this, this is for technical reasons, and I'm going to just dismiss it, but I'll mention it. Uh, single peak preferences. You say, what are those? Um, it just means there's one thing you like, not two things out there. In other words, you're not sitting there wanting 20% of the GDP to be defense and wanting it to be 80 at the same time. Uh, and you, you might then want to ask, what happens if you mess with that assumption? We can, for this, we'll just dismiss it. Later in the class, we'll look at that. Uh, anyway, so, you know, one issue, perfect information, everybody voting on this distance rule, uh, single peak preferences, two parties, uh, and six, everybody votes. Now, later in this course, you will see that business about everybody voting is really uh, a lot to swallow. I mean, in Australia and a few other places, you actually get close to that. You know why? Because if you don't vote, you pay a small fine. Um, by contrast, in the U.S., the way it almost works, if you try to vote, you may pay. Um, the, um, I can spell that out in a lot of ways. But a lot of election systems in practice discourage voting. Most of the European systems don't do uh, the things that systems with really low voting turnouts, like the United States, uh, do. In, in particular, what most everywhere in Europe does is the state prepares the list of people who is going to vote, who is legally ineligible to vote. Um, that may not sound like much, but by contrast, in the U.S., that's not true. You've got to go register yourself. That registration business can be made enormously complicated. Uh, and if, if the local officials want to make it impossible to vote, it's pretty easy to do it. Students find this out all the time when in college towns they all try to register to vote and then the great game begins by how many students can we disqualify for one reason or another. Guess why they try to do that? The, the local authorities don't want to be voted out by students. You can just imagine if you ran Torino, uh, what the Torino authorities would do. I don't know how that works in here. Do, do you, do they, get, they don't get to vote, except in the, they can, uh, in the local uh, vote election. vote for local election. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so everybody votes. So we will just think of the six assumptions here. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to erase this. Just, and I'll try, that might be useful to keep this. Now I'll just have to erase it, um, I think. Um, now, I want to sort of do the sort of classical model. I got this, I got this junk out here. Now, uh, this is the famous spatial model. And if you take a graduate course in, or an upper division undergraduate course at many universities, they all sort of teach you this. Uh, but it's relative, it can be done relatively simply. So we're going to, it's a spatial, spatialization of the issue. What, remember what the issue was. What percent of the GDP do we spend on defense? And at one side it's zero. Uh, at another, then there might be, well you can't do it all, right? Even though in the United States, when I listen to people, I sometimes get the impression they'd actually like to spend the entire GDP on defense. That's not true, you've got to eat. And, and things like that. So I'm gonna, we'll rule, if I, I'm gonna write 100 here, and we'll understand that uh, what we're really talking, we'll leave like 10% of the economy so you can eat it or drink it, right? Uh, but for simple purposes, so now I've got, now all you do in a spatial model is you go around and you figure out where's the population on this uh, business? What's their views? And, you know, I mean, can I just ask you, how much would you like to spend? Uh, just make it up. <laughs> Give me a number between zero and 100. How much, what percentage of the GDP do you want to spend on defense? 
35? Okay. Uh, uh, let's guess. Uh, actually, even the U.S., which spends a ton on defense, I think, I may be wrong, I believe we outspend more than everybody else. Do you know what the actual percentage is? Could be six, any, any, anybody six, want to guess? 20? Yeah. Oh. It's One only, it's about four. It's about four. four. I mean, which is a lot. So, uh, they, what's that? Yeah. It, they, anyway, so but we'll do 35. That's fine. I'm happy to. Um, 35. Now, since I want to represent your view, I'm going to actually draw you right here. One person. That's supposed to be a person. You know, okay. I mean, if you want art, as I say, go to the Panama Tech. Um, all right. Now, I mean, how much do you want to spend on defense? Three? Okay. <laughs> just a cautious liberal approach. All right. Uh, so I put that there. Now, what I'm, you see what I'm actually doing? Oh, no. Yes, I'm okay. Okay. What I'm actually doing is I'm using the heights to represent the number of people, and out here I'm representing the position. So, how about you? I need a number. Seven. All right. Uh, look, actually, I want you to. Ch I'm sorry to sort of sound like that. I need somebody to want either three or thirty-five. I just want to show you. So, can I emerge you just for purposes of argument? You want thirty-five. Yeah. And this begins to sound like a real election. You're getting there. But now, my point is, okay. So now I can put you up here. And so all I can do, if I went around this room, I can, you know, every time one of you gives me a number, I can put it up. And so what would I end up with? In this place, especially since I queued you with the four, I could be all over the landscape. But you, know, you can see, right? I mean, I, I for instance, poor Tom here, gets tired um, writing little people. I could just use the height. Why don't I replace that with a line of this height, which is two, four, six, et cetera. So I can turn this into a graph. And the heights represent the number of people on this line holding that position. And then, you know, in the sort of little jump everybody makes all the time uh, in economics, we could imagine this is continuous. Now, you know it's not, right? You're discrete people. Um, but so I might have a lot of people here and some people here. And, you know, in the U.S., I might have a lot more out of here, uh, or whatever. Um, and these are really just little people standing on each other. Then if I connect it, I'm going to imagine that this is the heights, right? See what I'm doing is I'm really drawing the tops. All right, now, the uh, problem here is, if everybody votes, if you're, I mean, I just, this, this is the distribution of opinion. Um, now, it looks to me that a lot of people like it out here, though there are a lot of folks here. Now, let's think about, if you're a politician, I'm, in fact, let me just for purposes make this one very simple. I'm going to... I'm going to change the shape of this curve in a second, but this makes everything. All right, why does this I know the, the eraser is not. Oh, yeah, sorry. You know, you could really shut this place down, right? Some night you just take the erasers. I mean, I, in, in American universities where we're often broke for long periods, I mean, I teach in a state university. I've often run out of chalk. I never thought about running out of erasers, but that's <laughs> like actually sort of like, like shutting down the trucks inside of a teamster strike. Uh, in a trucking strike, you can really bring a place to its knees if they can't get deliveries. Erasers, I had never thought of as the soft underbelly of American or any other universe. Anyway, all right, let's do this just for purposes. Let's assume that's the distribution. Okay, now, um, if you're a politician and you want to get elected, where do you go knowing the distribution of opinion is like that? What's, the, what's your offer? If I make this, well, you can sort of see this, right? 
50, I don't know. Yeah, all right, 50, yeah, let's, let's say 50. Okay, now, somebody else running, we have two parties. Uh, why don't you be the second party? Where do you go? You want to top these guys. You want to get more votes than they do. Where would you go? Pick a spot and I'll work you through the logic. You want to be him. He's just gone here thinking that, hey, this is what most of them want. Where do you go? And why? Well, on the right side. Of course, all of us want to be on the right side. <laughs> but that's <laughs> All right, I'm going to put you here. All right. All right, now let's think about this. This admittedly can be a little tough to sort of work through. The distance rule means that we'll have a few people out here. We'll have somebody in zero. Um, the, um, the distance rule means that everybody to this side of this bird is going to vote for them, right? There, you understand why? Because they're the nearest one. And everybody on this side, on this one, will vote for her. That's clear. What do you do in the middle? Our rule would be you go for the one nearest you. So I will, this is not quite perfect, but basically about half of them will go there and the other half will go there. But it looks to me that on that rule, this side, the one on the left, would have slightly more votes. So they'd win. All right, now think about that. You want to change where you go? Because you've just discovered you'll lose under the distance rule. Where would you go? Where can you get more votes? Let, let me make an explicit point that is often fudged. You have to do it explicitly if you were doing this formally. Can you go to the same place or not? And what would happen if all the parties arrived at the same place? I'll deal with that in a second. But where, where do you, where would you go? You have to go closer. Yeah, you can see the logic of this. Actually, what has to happen is they converge. They have to converge. Um, and then the question is, okay, what if they're identical? Lots of people treat this. Some people will say, uh, and the, they'll introduce a kind of ad hoc assumption, which is basically, okay, these parties can't um, absolutely duplicate each other, which begs the question, and what do you do when you get into that gray zone? At that point, for you and the, as you as the voter, you could just toss a coin. Um, you're going to get this, basically the same package or one that's you know indiscernibly non-identical. I mean, that is, so you're going to get something about the same package. That's the point of this voting model. Given all the stuff we had up here, if you want to win, you've got to go to the place that maximizes your vote, and there's only one such point. And every party's going to have to converge on that. What would happen to a person who starts out where this lady started out, over here, and then says, I'm very distressed because I believe to spend any less on defense would be morally wrong. What happens to that party if that's the position they take? What, what happens? We're counting votes. They don't get the They lose. That's right. That's right. This is the point. This system, this is the, if you like, it's the strength. Could be obnoxious, depends what the point is for. Um, but just take my point. Under this thing really does give you an outcome that is, doesn't, it doesn't give everybody what they want, right? I mean, you've got, in fact, it's giving very few people what they want, exactly. Most everybody wants something else. But they're getting the closest sort of approximation to that, this is, and it must converge. This is the sort of, this, this, the, the voter, let me just explain that odd term, the median voter. The median voter is that person sitting wherever it is that finally decides. Um, if you thought of 100 voters, and we'll waive this ugly question of you know, 50 or 51, um, 
The median voter, let's say it's the 51st voter in a group of 100, who if you can line up that median voter, you've got the other 50 and you win. That's why the, they call these things median voter models. Medians are things that you know, just divide the distribution uh, into two. It's not the in, in income, it's not the average. It's just really, you line up the people. Um, and thus, you've just discovered the median voter, you've just learned the convergence property of these simple models. Okay? Um, now, uh, but you needed all of those assumptions. Now, I want to focus just on one. There's a lot of ways you can take these models apart. But the one that's really telling, I think, is the what I want to do next. Uh, in the class, later, we'll look at a bit of these. Uh, but um, let's now make, uh, all right, I will not play with any of stuff. Let's just stick with our two parties, everybody votes. Now, in, the, the a crucial condition was that when she came out and said, I'm for this, everybody knew it. And they understood what she was saying. It's like they didn't understand her speech, I'm for this level, as some kind of funny code which meant I want to really double the rate of something else. But it was just, it's just, it's just straightforward. It means what it says and it says what it means. Um, now let's try something else. And then you can sort of see how this model can turn around um, in a hurry. I didn't used to ask this, but now I think I have to, Torino being a nicely ironic town uh, for this. I mean, this was a place with something like 180,000 auto workers 50 years ago, a lot. And now what, 5,000, something like that, are there? Um, are folks familiar with unions, at least as an idea? I understand you may never have seen one, depending on where you're coming from <laughs> there. Uh, or you know, union leaders are often now like exotic birds. Uh, in uh, zoos, you see them on TV and they're trotted out for, you know, generally to endorse something that is definitely not a union plan uh, in its origins. Um, but, all right, so you get the idea of what unions do, which is they typically represent their workers, or so it is hoped. We'll bypass that question, but we'll assume everybody's honest. Um, so they typically can maybe raise wages, get some benefits if they're successful. If they're not, of course, they don't. So our unions. Now, I will ask you to just believe this. I'm just going to stipulate that as a condition for the model. Employers don't generally like unions. You can cite me an occasional exception. Uh, but mostly, they don't. Uh, the best they will do, you can get German employers to say, well, we really like our co-determination systems. They don't either. Uh, for most of them. I mean, there's an occasional one. Uh, but the German system is more complicated than the typical you know, union scheme. But my, my point is simply, just get the idea that employers don't want unions. Now, the, the way I typically, typically model this is to go back to the United States in the 1840s of Massachusetts. <clears throat> there, besides not women not having the right to vote, we're just having a male suffrage here. But at that point, the, the Massachusetts economy was a, almost a purely textile economy and industrialization, which means it's very labor intensive. All right? So we're going to have, I maybe mean, it's the case, I mean, Europe, Europe had these cases too, but I'll, I'll just stick with the one I know well so I can manipulate it. Got the question? Uh, okay, it's dangerous to raise your hand in my classes because I actually will call on you. Um, the, uh, the, I could issue, maybe I should issue cards, you can raise your hand, but I won't call on you for it. I'll only give five of them away, of course. For course. Anyway, now let me take you through a sort of union uh, issue. Suppose we have a company town. Um, could be, it could be in the Ruhr in, in Germany, could be in eastern France, could be in England. I'm going to set it in Massachusetts. Um, where the town has been founded by folks. Uh, the towns in Massachusetts, Lowell and Lawrence, were founded by two gentlemen named Lowell and Lawrence, uh, for example. And they were the big textile, uh, they were among the largest textile owners of the period. 
their descendants became like president of Harvard and things like that. Um, the, um, so Mr. Lawrence and Mr. Lowell, um, they, <clears throat> one morning, you have a desire to start a union. And um, so there, the question becomes, shall we have a law in Lowell or Lawrence that makes it easy to start a union? Maybe we'll make it set up a procedure for counting the votes or put some limits on what the employer can do or something like that. Well, Mr. Lowell and Mr. Lawrence, what's their ideal rate? What's their ideal rate of unionization? By hypothesis, we'll just stipulate here. There, this, I should observe the stipulation is exactly correct in reality. What's their idea of an ideal rate of unionization? Put a number on it. You have zero to one hundred percent. You will notice it has the same structure. Shall the whole town? Shall the whole workforce? Now, obviously, Mr. Lowell and Mr. Lawrence shall not be joining the union. So we'll stipulate that we'll accept those two capitalists. And then we'll just have the percentage of the citizenry minus those two. That's what 100% will represent. What, how much do they want to see unionized? Come on, folks. Thank you. You're, you own the factory. You own the mall. Well, how much, if you don't like unions, what's your ideal rate of unionization? Why, why is this hard? <laughs> That's right. Yes, exactly. So now we put them here. I draw Mr. Lowell and Mr. Lawrence. Okay? They're out there at two. <laughs> they want zero. Now, this being, I'm going to make, we'll make a huge leap here. The rest of the population, everybody that could join the union and is tired of working 16 or 15 hours a day, uh, for uh, six or six days a week um, and making extremely low wages, you know, a euro for the day or something. Um, what's their, do they, how many, what percentage of the workforce would they like to see in the United States? Everybody, right? So we'll put the whole town up here now. So I just marked that. So now I have. Let me just for clarity, we have this thing out here, and the whole rest of the population <coughs> is out here. Okay, now, you're running as a politician, and the only, you know, we have our, all our conditions, one issue, everybody voted distance rules, single peak per all that crap. Um, where do you go to get elected? This is a one hundred. What's that? This is a one hundred. I'm sorry. 100. Yeah, you go here. Yeah, that's a piece of cake. I mean, Convergence says everybody, that po all politicians should be supporting unions. Now, you'll notice in reality, by the way, that's not. There must be reasons for that. We'll get to that in a second. All right, but now, that's right. Convergence will work in this case. Now, what if I change one assumption in that? The assumption is, is that it's not quite right to say that everybody has perfect information. Instead, there's some costs. That information, like in, in the model, it's like we're all in a town meeting and you know the 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 um, uh, the candidates just come out there and you know they're telling the truth. There's no question they mean it. There is no question the words they're using. It's just it just it's sort of like it's like actually Homer. When the uh, Greek gods are, are are communicating with their favorite humans, like they know it's Minerva uh, or Apollo talking to them, and they get it and stuff like that. It's like it's like there's this instantaneous trans uh, transmission of information, and they all get it. Well, what if that's not true? What if the information is all but perfect? By which I mean the following. In this simple stylized model, we all know there's only one issue and we know what it is. But it takes a while to get credible. Or that they possibly have never heard of you when you come out for your one, for your 100% unionization or whatever. There's some little cost, there's some slight imperfection 
in, in the system. It's all but perfect, because I, all but perfect meaning nobody's fooled. That's the nobody's fooled thing that I really want to draw attention to here. And how would I express that? Suppose it costs, suppose there are campaign costs. In other words, campaigning is not free. Information doesn't flow costlessly from uh, <clears throat> politicians to voters or vice versa. Suppose now it costs $2,000, which most conveniently, thanks to Mr. Draki, the euro and the dollar are just about as parity, so you can just think euros if you want. But I'll, this being Massachusetts in the 1840s, I'll do the 2000 Now, by assumption in my, in this little model, the workers don't have any extra money. They basically live off their salaries. They just, you know, that's it. That's, that's the end of it. I mean, this is sort of, you'll eventually, if you go on in economics, you might learn about a classical savings function. Uh, where uh, basically the capitalists have the savings and the workers have no savings. Now, a gentleman not far from us in Milan, Luigi Passanetti, proved in a lot of capitalist economies you can expand that condition and a lot of conclusions will still be true. Never mind, that's another class. My point is let's just stick with our classical savings function here. There's no workers with any money. So they, now Mr. Lowell and Mr. Lawrence have tons of money. So they have no problem getting over that entry barrier, all right? Um, now, you're a politician, you need money to run. Where do you go? The condition is you must get at least $2,000 to, to be able to run. You're it. where do you go now? To zero. Yep, uh, so there. All right, now, you, um, you're, you're running for office. You know, you know that everybody wants a union. Um, and you know that they're going to have to vote. But you can't reach them without the dough, without the money. Right? I should have not used too much colloquial English. Where do you go? What would happen? All right, I sent your sister. Go ahead. I mean, this is, look, this is why we are in class. It's also a reason why, to my knowledge, you can talk all you want about MOOCs, those massively online things. I want to see them do this in a you know, around the world course where somebody has a question like that. I, I don't believe it can be done. My, or as I tell my students in the United States, it's a reason why my job probably cannot get completely exported to India or any of the developing countries. Um, so you're, you're sort of thinking about this. You want to go there, right? I mean, you could, but you, what happens if you go here? How do you get the word out? I do not need actual money, so. Yeah, I understand, but what I, in my model, there's a campaign cost. You must have that amount. I know what you're saying. I'll go around and no, I'll I, meet people or something, <laughs> right? I, I do not go to that 100, I go closer to 100. Yeah, but now how much money does Mr. Lowell and Lawrence give you? Some. Why would they give you anything at all? Why don't they just stick with zero? And in, in, in a model where we're assuming self-interest here, you know, this is the whole liberal capital L in the European sense, Adam Smith type stuff, not the American sense of liberal is something else. Um, now, Lowell and Lawrence, if you want money to run, you've got to go to zero. If, in other words, there's a campaign cost conditions real, if campaigning is not costless, um, and, and then you're stuck. Even though you know that everybody in the system wants something different, what's defeating you uh, is the lack of cash. You can't get over that threshold. Okay, this is a pretty interesting here. Notice in this, this is a not, people here are not being fooled in the sense that you're not, you're not coming to them and saying, I'm really for a union, but of course I'm also for freedom. And then later freedom turns out to mean, well, you know, push to it. We can't force people to join unions. That would be, you know, forcing them to be free. Well, so. Um, or, and you're not telling, you're not switching terms or anything else. 
let's put it a different way. In our, in our hypothet hypothetical model, we got two parties, right? Suppose a third party appeared. Suppose I now vary the condition here. What's the problem the third party faces? Come on, folks. You can think. It is not, I understand your teachers don't typically ask you to walk through like this, but they should. Because this is the type of calculations that people running for office actually make. Um, what's with the third party? What would happen if, you know, I turn you into the third party person? Where do you go and why? What do I do as a third party? What's that? What do I do as a third party? I don't understand the... You, the you're, you, you can choose any position you want here. What do I want to do? You... Let's Just, do this one. You want to go here? Yes. Okay. What would happen here? You go there, how much money do you have? You can't get any money from the workers on our simple assumption they have, they're living on their wages. In other words, notice this, your problem is not the number of parties. Yes? But, I mean, if I put myself on zero and I spend two, but I know that I will lose it because most of the people will vote for 100. Am I right? Am I, right? I mean... Well, everybody... Here's, you, here's what happens. You sit there with your, somewhere out there, forlornly, like being in the Alps, looking for water or something in a snowstorm. You can't raise the money you need for a campaign. Okay, but then why should I run if I know that I will lose? So why should I spend my, my point. that little? Yeah, so people don't do it either. Then they turn around and say, see, nobody's running a third party. That must mean the people are really happy. This is the folks who take the position in um, Europe on the democratic um, deficit to say there's no democratic deficit, why people should be really unhappy in running. That's, that's their position. You can see the hole uh, here, right? I mean, one hole in it is that, hey, it's actually pretty costly to do this stuff uh, in real states. My point is very simple. It's this campaign cost condition. And this, this sum could be anything. Now, it, and you actually start looking, which lead, should lead you right to this sort of basic conclusion, real fast. Um, like, okay, what, what empirically? Now, forget the models where people just in Locke or Mill or somebody where we're all sort of sitting around under a tree deliberating. What does it actually cost to run for office and, and by, you know, and win, win elections? Well, what was the last U.S. presidential election? They had a, what was it, three or four billion on the record. I remember when, in the mid '90s, when Ross Perot ran, early '90s, uh, and Perot was a billionaire, so he floated his own candidacy pretty much by himself. And he did Perot being Perot. He sort of got in for a while, got out, then came back into the race. And so he wasn't in for most of the campaign. He burned up through way over a hundred million dollars. Uh, in the spec, yeah. I have a, a question on your mind. Yeah. If you challenge assumption four, which is the perfect knowledge, perfect information, mm -hmm. and so you introduce the need for communication, mm -hmm. you challenge immediately the diagram uh, that you have there because there is no 100% that has a crystallized opinion, but there is room for. Yeah, no, you're, let me, by, I'm going to just stick, I want to work with this strong assumption so you can see that the issue here is not fooling people. I don't disagree. I'm about to say, all right, let's look at real models. Let's start coming much closer to real life. Um, but my point is simply, uh, on the pure logic of this, you don't have to fool people. People, in, in this the sort of strong conclusion here is that in real life political systems, it's not necessary at all that people are fooled or that they're stupid. Uh, it's that they're just too poor to control the system. They actually can't float the cost. And you know, that sets right, this sets up a very straightforward test for this that should be empirical. 
if they, um, it's, you, can, you can, that's said, you can look at this and see if there's anything like this out there. You, for the average human to control democratic political systems, you need to, in effect, you need organizing somehow. You've got to find a way to spread the costs in just tiny amounts. Now, under my strict assumption, you still can't do it because you just have no savings at all. But I, I admit that that's, I, I, no one had not probably even in the 1840s uh, were the conditions like that. The, the point is simply, I do that so you can just to underline and bring out the stark character of the campaign cost condition. Because that's the nub of the system. And so the, what I'm effectively telling you is this, in what I'll call the classical liberal theories of democracy, they way underestimate the actual costs of political campaigns. And they sort of just treat it like it's an afterthought. You know, one of my favorite examples of this is a guy, a historian named Sean Wilentz, very able, a well-written book. He wrote a history of American political parties between uh, the 1780s and 1860 in America, about 1,100 pages. He claimed to be, he was obviously aiming to be sort of synoptic, meaning cover the whole waterfront. He never bothered to look at party finances at all, is a point I made in a review of the book. Um, and that's the way most people do political science and most political history. It's like what I call the money grows on trees theorem. That is to say, it's just out there somehow. Um, a modern version of this, which I urge you not to believe, is that there's a friendly billionaire out there who just sort of has the public uh, good in mind, and whatever it is that the population need will somehow be supplied by somebody. Uh, I mean, it was just a wonderful example of this. The word came out uh, over the last weekend. It was a gentleman named Ted Cruz. Uh, was running for president of the United States. Mr. Cruz is unusual even for right-wing Republicans. He's a Princeton graduate who, who acts and talks like he, he is a senator from Texas, but he tries to pretend he, almost as though he had the political attitudes of West Texas, which he uh, did not come through that way. At any rate, Cruz uh, turns out to have raised suddenly a ton of money uh, and they actually apparently went to see one of the billionaires that suddenly gave him a ton of money. Uh, and the guy just said, well, you know, just a, 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 I, I was looking and I could see that an eccentric billionaire can really drive a race. Yeah, that's right, they can. Uh, except in the U.S., uh, you won't see one of them, you will see hundreds of them. Uh, in actual presidential campaigns. Um, we'll set that to a side. That's not our, our problem right now. Um, my point is simply, uh, the campaign cost condition is really fundamental. And you got to deal with it. And it actually just inverts the usual logic of uh, political parties. And once you begin to focus on that, then you arrive at the following conclusion. That, you know, the only, really, the only thing, when you have party competition, you, the only thing that can be competed, if you like, off, put on offer, is stuff for which you can find the finance. And that's all. Is that? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Because, I, because you mentioned that in this very simple or small time model. I'm sorry. Yeah. This is a very small time, yeah. or no, a simple model. And, uh, the wages of the workers actually is consumed when it's on. Yeah. Yes. So I think that there must be voting cost. Voting. The cost of voting. Otherwise, if there is no cost of voting, some people may not be when free they have perfect information, no cost of voting, they can vote for vote. I know where you're going on this. Let yes. me just deal with that. The, the, they could vote, but they have no way of knowing what the can under our model, what the candidate stands for. Yes. I mean, they, you mean you could go in and vote random. That, now that slides, but let, let's assume you're right. Now you're the politician. You've no way of making, by assumption, you've no way of making yourself known. Yes. So now let's suppose we've got the two parties up there. What is their position by our model for the unionization offer? It's zero, right? 
So you could vote randomly for two parties offering you nothing. You know, that looks like a lot of elections sometimes I see, but you can see the problem, right? Which is you can't, this model does not give you convergence on what the population wants. Yeah, you can even go through the motions of voting. I actually thank you for the example which I may use in the future. Uh, you can go ahead and vote randomly for folks who are going to not offer you anything. Um, I will not comment on whether somebody from Asia might not have got no comment. We will not do that. Uh, the uh, chicken soup. Now, look, let's. So, what do you actually have to do to sort of get um, something to happen in this system? Well, let me show you a combination, a, 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 a trick that will lead you even further from sort of mainstream thinking, even though it's a simple development of this. Um, notice what I've got here. What I have here is a one-sector economy in which uh, it was cotton textiles, which is true in Lowell and Lawrence, heavily labor-intensive. Um, and now let me introduce a different, suppose that was 1840. Suppose we come to 1936 or 1940, um, and Mr. Lowell and Mr. Lawrence of their descendants are still here. The two of them, the two of them are sitting where they have been for a century. You know, the Republican, this was the Republican Party, but, and then, you know, and, uh, there's two people out there. Uh, at zero unionization. Now, one morning, they build a car finally arrives in Lowell, and Mr. Rockefeller appears and builds a gas station and an oil refinery. Now, the thing about the oil industry, then and now, uh, is that in contrast to cotton textiles, it is not labor intensive. It is capital intensive. Um, like, you know, the, the, in the paranoid version of this that got very fashionable in America in the mid-1990s, uh, maybe a little earlier, um, there was the Japanese robot run factory that had no workers. Uh, and, you know, this didn't actually exist, and it still hasn't happened, although I hear now that there is a machine in Los Angeles that will actually assemble a hamburger. Uh, and the claim that, <laughs> no, which is, you're getting very close. That one really did strike a nerve for a lot of folks um, there. Anyway, so Mr. Rockefeller shows up, sets up his thing, and so now there's Lowell, Lawrence, and Rockefeller. Now, Rockefeller has, you know, at least as much money in, as Lawrence and Lowell. Maybe he has 10 times more, in actual fact. He had probably 100 times more. Anyway, he's running a capital-intensive uh, gas and oil operation. So one morning, Rockefeller decides he'd like to do something political. Now, we'll sort of leave it vague why. Maybe he wants tax rates hot or he wants to build a road or something. Um, the, uh, so now he calls in some politicians and he tells them, look, uh, I'm paying for the surveys. In fact, I've paid guys to invent surveys, which is true. Uh, in this case, uh, and they're telling me that this town would all vote for a union. Well, this is admittedly a little arch, but you can see where I'm going here. Um, I'll, I'll finance you for 20% unionization. In other words, here's the cash for 20%. Um, and so Mr. You know, Joe Blow uh, comes out, a Lawrence Pop, a, a well-known politician, and suddenly we have, in terms of money, the two, we have a second offer on the table. It is for 20% unionization. Now, what determined the size of that? Entirely what was the money available for the position, right? If Rockefeller said 20, he might have said 40, but he doesn't like unions either. Uh, in this simple model, it's 20. You can have 20% or nothing. Now, you're a voter. What does the distance rule imply uh, about who you vote for? 
20%. What's that? 20%. Yeah, everybody votes for the 20% one. So for the first time in a century, Lowell and Lawrence are out on their tail. Uh, and you have a 20% unionization. Now let me ask you a few simple questions and you, I hope we'll see a completely different approach to modern party competition, what's going on around you. Is this what the population really wants or not? No, it's not. They all want 100% unionization. Is this a real dynamics? Nevertheless, in other words, you got two parties. Are they really competing? Yes, they are. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they're going to move around. The guy's going to be walking around saying, my opponent is giving you zero. I'm going to give you 20. Um, they are not, and is this, but now is this being done, and this is an enormously important point in terms of actually understanding the real world. Is this being done because there's collusion between the two parties or because Lowell, Lawrence, and Rockefeller secretly agree that they'll have a kind of cartel or a fraud? Rebecca says no. No, of course not. It's being done independently. The guy says, look, I want to get control of the state. I'll give you 20. The other guys are sitting there looking, oh, God, he gave us, gave them 20. What are we going to do? So now you've got a competitive political system in which a population is voting by a landslide for the 20. It is not, and the two, and, and we are miles from what everybody wants. Miles from that. But there's a real dynamics of this. Um, and, you know, if, now, in a minute, I'll walk you through what the other guys do in that. They said, just see this. You know, huge numbers of people think that in some fundamental sense, the non-public, if you like, the non-maximizing of the public uh, desires in current political systems derives from the fact that all the parties are colluding with each other. Now, they, in fact, often might be. This situation might, in a legislature, lend itself to a lot of deals. But in the basics here, they're not colluding at all. Uh, and this system is not driven uh, by that. Now let me ask, so we now find Mr. Rockefeller wins. He comes in, he says, I'm going to give you a new deal. 20% unionization. Everybody goes, fantastic. Victory for the working class. Uh, 20%. Um, what's actually going on here is you've got a huge shift in industrial organization. Uh, you got the oil guys coming in to oppose the textile guys. Industrial change is driving this process uh, in the form I've got it. Workers are sitting there passive, and I suppose we, they're not passive in real life. But just let's just try to understand the models. Okay, so now what does? Um, let's go back to the zero guys, Lowell and Lawrence. They've now lost. What's more, it looks like they're going to lose every election into the indefinite future forever. Why? Because they're up. They're stuck at zero. What happens if they go to 20? Well, on our side, we're in favor of zero. We're not paying for anything but zero. Um, so <clears throat> they could try to reason with Lowell and Lawrence. But if you were Lowell and Lawrence and their party, what would you do? I would get to 21%. What's that? I would get to 21%. You can't, though. Uh, Lowell and Lawrence are sticking the mud. They, they lose money at 21%. <coughs> the oil guys don't, or they lose relatively less. Now, I think what you're, if you're Lowell and Lawrence, what you want to do is this. You've got to get the discussion off that one issue. You're a loser if, if it's at one issue. You'll never win on the unionization issue. So what do you do? Well, look, I'll just make a point. Almost everywhere around the world, you name it, in India, in Britain, uh, in a lot of the United States, the conservative party, the more conservative party, has a funny tendency over and over. It's like an underlying statistical regularity. They're the ones who are, one, allied with a sort of dominant traditional religion, or they run ex-generals, or, which is a lot, there are a lot of successful generals and conservative parties, or they, you know, they, they, they got to change the subject. And so they do. I mean, and if you start looking at uh, politics,
ethics as sort of a set of issues aligned with some real world policy positions. Um, I think you get a quite different approach to sort of analyzing political speech. I mean, where I got into this, I admit, I was listening to the Treasury Secretary on a radio program, and you could hear uh, this guy approaching the mic, and he was talking like an ordinary human. Then suddenly they give him the mic, and, and he suddenly starts talking in this heavily stilted, highly artificial language. And I said to myself, this guy, this is very interesting. It's like he's entering into a different world, in which he was, as it took me a while to sort of sort out. I mean, the public rhetoric stuff is, is quite interesting. Now, um, we will see later in this course uh, the way people can change subjects. I mean, one example, one, what, besides the traditional religious appeal or the appeal of a, of a victorious and popular run of losing generals, although the United States nearly did um, a couple times, um, but um, besides that stuff, um, you can, what's the, the simplest move is, right, just talk about the candidate's personal qualities. In other words, you argue, they go out and I'm going to say, you argue that, you know, Mr. Roosevelt, say, uh, Mr. Rockefeller's guy, by hypothesis, this, the reality was more complicated. I warn you about that right now. We'll talk maybe about the New Deal later. Uh, but, you just don't vilify the opponent. What you do, you say, for example, um, you dig up, in the American expression, is digging up dirt. There is, I am sure, a similar expression in every country that does this. Um, like you go argue, and if they haven't done anything, you circulate rumors. Uh, you know, you circulate the rumor that the candidate, once upon a time, slept with a cow, you know, sort of did the Orwellian two legs good, four legs bad, and violated that basic command or something like that. And it could be wholly false. I mean, the McCain, in the, uh, I think it was the South Carolina primary back in 2000, uh, the McCain forces were circulating the rumor, no, was it the Bush? One of the Republican candidates was circulating the rumor that the other one had had a, uh, an African American child. Uh, it was absolutely garbage, nothing to it, but they were circulating it. Um, and you know, most people, you'd say, know enough to dismiss that. Well, most people do. On the other hand, in a campaign primary, especially in the final days, you watch all kinds of mud get flying when it's tough to deny. It can be amazing. Um, you can sort of see here, too, as you start to reason through this, well, if candidates are well known, <coughs> and understood, it's hard to circulate nonsense. If, on the other hand, you have them coming out of nowhere, um, it's easy to circulate nonsense. And you know, you can begin to get to some interesting propositions about how campaigns might function. Like, why is all the mud go up in the final days and things like that? Because nobody has time to answer. Uh, and, and stuff like that. But um, my point is, uh, see what actually happens. The tendency is to change the subject. The loser on the popular issue is probably going to try something else uh, there. Like when the Goldwater forces in 1964 were losing to Lyndon Johnson, they, were, they had some holding that said they could make some, uh, they were running on a free market pitch. Nobody much was buying it. This was 1964. And they discovered they could get votes at least some votes with pitches on traditional morals. So they did that uh, instead. And that somewhat that became a popular combination, which on the face of it doesn't make any intrinsic logic. That's because it didn't have any intrinsic logic. Uh, it was, however, a political logic that folks could see them. Now, just think about this one now, folks. So now we've got uh, people talking a lot about candidates. Maybe they're introducing a second issue like freedom or something like that. Or you can throw another one in. You can throw in a genuine economic issue that might, would it confuse voters? Or would it give them an option? You can decide what your language is. Um, you might say, we'd like to build, I'm going to make it up, we'd like to build a bridge. We think if you could build a bridge across this river to, I'm going to make it up, the state of Maine, which is not next to Lawrence or Lowell, it's near it. 
Um, if you could do that, this would be really good for the economy. So we're offering you, nah, we're not going to do the unionization, but we'll build you the bridge. Um, now, we'll, this, you could say, well, what would the other folks do? You can argue about that. And there's an ugly question about taxes and pay for this we'll worry about later. Um, possibly they might try to throw it all on gas taxes or something like that. In other words, on the other side's factors. Never mind. Um, the point is, you could, one way to get out of this is throw some other issues in there. Um, and the other thing, though, is notice this. What is the inflexible requirement for having this discussion? More money. What Basically what happens is, once you start one of these things, there is a kind of a logic of an arms race. Uh, and uh, so you get, therefore, more money and more money, and in effect, where you, you can see how the system can be driven by charge, counter-charge campaign costs, and the, the main effect of all of this is to put control of the system out of the hands of the voters. You just, in other words, what was the original $2,000 campaign cost now becomes 10,000, 20,000, a million, 100 million, 600 million. Uh, there's a very clear escalator, escalation dynamic there, and it's very interesting. Okay, so um, now that's now. So if you're doing this, let me just try to draw. I want to bring this part of the discussion to a close and get on to the press very briefly. And I'm glad to take questions so we can have a discussion. But you can see where I'm headed. The argument is is that. The campaign cost condition is for real. And in the real world, people, it costs the campaign. And the classical democratic theorists have hugely underestimated these. And if you like, the free market of ideas isn't free. <clears throat> and so this is a problem for models of party competition. And unfortunately, I sort of gave you the solution in posing the problem, which is, OK, you've got to figure out how you're going to pay these costs. Now, what systems typically do uh, is they combine costs with eh, what an unsympathetic being like myself would describe as bribes in a general sense, not specifically legal sense. They give uh, politicians lots of incentives, too. I mean, if you notice, it's hard to miss in Europe, the United States, or Asia these days, just everywhere. Your political class typically likes to think of itself and consort with multi-millionaires. I mean, they just do, and they sort of think that's all there is to it. They just, I mean, I cannot tell you whether Valerie Trudeau-Valier is telling the truth uh, about Francois Hollande's attitude toward the poor. But I do know this, the type of attitude that she talks about in that famous memoir uh, is shared by an awful lot of politicians. And that when you study American congressmen and women, you quickly discover, like a lot of other legislators, um, they, and I'm quoting a tape conversation in a federal investigation of, a, of, a, of an Arizona woman legislator about 15 years ago, she said, I want to live the good life, and I don't have enough money. So she took an enormous bribe and got caught. Um, the um, this is, I mean, that's there's a lot of political money sloshing around, and it's not all for campaign costs. We'll be doing that uh, later in the course. We will actually sort of try to develop a typology. And there is this ugly problem too. In a world in which inequality grows by leaps and bounds within countries. Uh, across countries, as, as this discussion is complicated, because the middle classes of India and China are huge, so rural inequality trends change a bit depending on how you measure them. Uh, but when you go inside single countries, you get some pretty strange effects just out of inequality itself. Right? I mean, there's, a, I think, a strong tendency for uh, the political leadership to be pulled like iron filings up to the powerful magnets at the top. Uh, of the income distribution. Uh, but we'll just sort of set that uh, aside there. Th th these types of systems, somebody has to pay these costs. 
And I think it really does boil down to just two forms. Either we all pay a little, or you leave it to be paid by um, a few relatively rich people. In the United States, my own empirical work shows that both major parties, the Democrats too, are essentially dependent on contributions from the famous 1%, or to be precise, maybe 1.5%. Um, the, uh, they just, that's the only thing that floats political boats. Um, but what I'm essentially suggesting to you thus far is that party competition by itself will generate you a dynamic, but because it actually gets taken over by, if you like, the shifting economic dynamic. Now, you can take this in several directions. One way I often do it, it depends on the country and the time, is so what you want to actually do is learn how to model political systems according to the, if you like, the, the inside the business community conflicts that are there. And you can see that in Europe, this effort has just totally broken down. Just nobody does it. They, they, the, the, the whole of economics and political science, as far as I can tell, Watch the banks throw the bet, throw the costs of the bank failures in 2007, 2008 onto the public, and then just sort of sat there like, how did this magic act? Who did this? Why? How? That discussion just totally drops out. What you get is a discussion in Germany about how, for example, you know, the Greeks are. I mean, when I, the Greeks were stealing their money, or I actually heard this from my Parisian taxi driver the other week who was saying, well, you know, our problem in France is that the, you know, the, the Greeks are taking our money. And I couldn't resist saying, okay, uh, explain to me why France is slow growing because you sent some money down to Greece. What's this really about? That sort of got the point. On the other hand, I do not argue with taxi drivers much <laughs> in a country where I really don't know the language too well and I'm never sure where I'm going. Um, so, um, but you can sort of, this, this stuff is, is very widespread. But now, let me just, we'll deal with this. How, so you might then, in other words, how do you analyze industrial structures? Some of this course is about that. I want to walk you through what this looks like historically. Um, the, uh, the, uh, we'll, de we'll deal with that later. What I want to talk about right now, just for a few minutes, then we'll talk, you know, is how the, what's what's the relevance of this to discussions of the press? Okay, and the answer is you can see where I've gone here, which is to suggest you get a kind of black hole in the political system, and the black hole is any position that, if you like, all major investors in the system don't want represented probably can't get represented unless the population can organize in its own interest. You know, if, if the unions can organize a political party and they can actually effectively control it, you can throw unionization on, uh, on the issue. That's what happened to a considerable extent during the American New Deal. That's not the only thing that happened, though, because there's an industrial structure fit to that. And you can probably see where I'm headed uh, later in the course with the capital versus industrial pardon me, capital versus labor and intensive uh, industrial shifts. But, you know, newspapers are a bit like that. Um, the, fundamentally, <clears throat> what newspapers, ah, all right, your, your basic newspaper model is presumably a for-profit model. Now, this is where the national variations come in hugely. It is a fact that the nonprofit sector in different countries is very different depending on the laws uh, there. Um, and, and they can be big or small. In 19th century Britain, for example, it's pretty clear that there was a pretty, there was a lively and flourishing, uh, if you like, unionized, unionized pro-union or radicalized press right in the middle of the 19th century. And then it got sort of chilled by what? libel laws, actually. In other words, they changed the law to make it fairly easy to sue a paper. Uh, and the radical papers got sued, which is why all these current discussions about are bloggers members of the press, 
Are they entitled to press protections if they exist in countries is hugely important. I mean, this discussion is going on right around you right now. But let me stick right now with the, let's talk about just for-profit press where they're run to make money. Um, and you can sort of see where I'm headed, which is that that uh, black hole theorem is what I like to call it. In other words, that there's just nothing being said about anything that all investors are opposed to. Like what? Like tax rates that um, might hit them. I mean, in the United States, most of the major papers are owned by somebody now, some billionaire who was really opposed to higher taxes on billionaires. The uh, Washington Post being the most famous for uh, Jeff Bezos is clearly, um, let's say, hotly against tax increases on people like Jeff Bezos. Um, and this type of problem is right. Taxes, unionization, a lot of issues that you care about. Uh, there's no reason to think that a for-profit press will pick them up. Now, we can qualify that opinion later, but not much. And historically, they don't uh, do that. It is also the case, however, that in every country, um, an awful lot of the press, even if it starts out as for-profit, uh, doesn't end as for-profit, and it becomes bought by some fairly affluent group, and once occasionally they may try to make it a profit, they also run, um, they often, I would say probably always run the, the press also as a kind of political uh, device for themselves. Uh, and so what you see in the last, especially as papers, the, the, the United States and also France, though, uh, where uh, Julia Caget has a nice little book on this subject, um, they're going, the for-profit papers are just going out of business. And then they tend to fall into the hands, they either just close, uh, or they fall into the hands of some billionaire or something like that. Uh, we have this going on around you. We also have, of course, the, the, the spread of entirely new forms of media. Um, there was a view around for a while, which I always thought was foolish, um, that, well, the era of uh, the internet would mean hundreds or thousands of cheap, affordable papers that people could get info. Now, there is something to that view, which is why in the United States and elsewhere, fights about so-called network neutrality, meaning do the big telecommunications providers have to carry the smaller um, concerns at a fair price or not, at the same price, basically, if it's network neutrality, they carry everybody else. Can, can they, in other words, just do deals with billionaire companies uh, to bring you everything? Um, has been a hot political issue. It's, it's really a huge one. Uh, the, uh, it's also the case that if you watch US politicians, boy, after they got uh, attacked on some uh, internet things, they started talking about changing law. In the end, they couldn't do it because it turned out to be some business coalitions that were also active on that. Never mind. That's another discussion. Um, my point is, you know, the not-for-profit press in this situation then becomes pretty important for um, the consumption, the production of news, and to the extent anybody can hear it. Um, I don't... This whole issue is more complicated than I can go into here now. We'll talk about it later in the course. Um, it does turn out, though, this is a really interesting. One of the last papers we'll look at by uh, Luigi Zingales and, and some associates shows you just how powerful press stuff can be, where they model voting in the US Congress, and they are able to distinguish districts where the press has one attitude from the other. Uh, and they show you that, boy, does that change the votes of relatively identically matched congressmen and women. Uh, this, this, is, this is of considerable interest. Um, and I feel you can also see that I'm not taking the view that everything written in the press is the same. One thing I want to do in the class is look empirically at questions about 
what actually gets printed in presses, how, how much diversity there is in modern uh, societies, uh, and how that varies. That, that sort of we do, we do some things like that. Um, but where I end up on this is, um, you know, I, I want to stick with my black hole approach, which is that for-profit parties, I'm sorry, uh, parties where the for campaign cost condition is, is, is serious and real, don't function like the political parties that people envision in most of your courses in democratic theory. Uh, they don't converge, as in that Downsian model, uh, that I had with where, you know, and, and they can do that uh, by just altering, you know, you get almost perfect information, you know, where the issue didn't change. Now, you, you can, as Pepe's comment to me almost two hours ago now, uh, which is, hey, you know, they don't really have, uh, it's not as though people have perfect information. That's exactly correct. In fact, yes, in real world political systems, much of the contents of the information is up for grabs. People spend vast sums on it. Indeed, there is this sort of famous paradox uh, in, in some writings on money and politics where they're saying, uh, well, isn't it the case that given that it seems, you know, four billion for a presidential race doesn't seem so much money for what you can get out of it if you're super rich. To which the short answer is, well, actually, people are spending vast sums more on communications and public opinion. That doesn't show uh, in those totals. In other words, it's the, you know, the real world political systems have imperfect information, nothing like the all but perfect information I was just using to make my simple model points. But what I wanted to drive home to you was to be aware of these conclusions that have effectively uh, everybody, people, people are being fooled. They don't have to be fooled to have democratic control loss. They just have to be relatively poor in terms of what it takes to surmount the barriers to getting into the political system. And, and, I, and as I sort of suggested to you hurriedly here, uh, it's the same with the press. For-profit presses don't generally have uh, any incentive to bring you all the news. All the news, to, to, to mutate a famous line from the New York Times slogan, all the news that's fit to print is not all the news. Uh, you know, and you just won't see certain types of stuff uh, in for-profit newspapers. You're not going to find hardly anybody urging, or you won't see much labor reporting. That's a famous example. Uh, and you won't see anybody much, say, urging high tax rates on billionaires, a little. Now, because the problem has become a system problem, it's so bad, and then you will see a bit of this discussion. But when you go to specifics, they just, they just melt away like the morning mist uh, in a sort of hot uh, valve. Okay. So that's where I'm coming out here. I mean, this course is about, my course is about how do political systems, political parties, and industrial structures and financial structures, we'll get to that, uh, interact? But now what about questions? That's, I've essentially concluded what I'm trying to communicate. Uh, this is a lot to swallow, and it may not have been clear. What, I mean, can I deal with any questions here? What do people... Those of you who were thinking to move someplace else earlier are fine to offer a rebuttal, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> if you want. I mean, this is, uh, <coughs> tell me what, if anything, I can clarify or, uh, or, or object. Nothing terrible will happen. It's been, I used to say, I like to say to my, I, it's been years since I killed a student and it was really an accident. I didn't know the gun was loaded, which is what you always say in the United States. You know? Yeah, I think this area is a very, very, very gray area that we are trying to put up just together. Public information there for the first, I completely disagree with it. You know, in the sense that even if there is some violence between parties, like we have seen in, in many African countries, I will take kind of an example from Africa, parties have come together in the name of the well-being of the, the general public. 
But at the end, what has been discovered is that they don't themselves know the coming together of their, their, uh, their coming together. And at the end, they lose elections and they, they lose their reputation. So it was better when they stand independently, it is going to be less costly for them. And the risk of running independent election were better for them. Only the they realize this only after this election. Like one convergence of coalitions presently have won in uh, Nigeria, the present election yeah. was a good example. But elections before that were bad. And in fact, the African Union came into place because of convergence, but they have failed and in fact have improved Africa into a, a bigger world, poverty level, that in Africa we are standing independently as countries. Okay. So public information there on the well-being of the general public, I don't think matters to profit. No, I would say, if I may, just we might, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure I understand fall all of your thinking there. Mm -hmm. But um, I'd say you're nowhere near perfect information in any, uh, certainly not in the Nigerian political system. Um, and so I'm not surprised that you get really grotesque outcomes. There might be another question behind your question too, you could tell me, which is, <clears throat> it's interesting to observe, yes, is this not most interesting? In the last 25 years, um, or so, 30 years, you had this situation where folks have urged, uh, the folks <coughs> urging you for free markets uh, around the world, which would include the IMF and the World Bank for much of that period, though not all of it, and certainly many of the major companies, G7, for example, at least, if not the G20. They have also been telling you to change the political system into a democracy. And you know you watch what happens in these systems, and you see. Uh, I mean, my reading of free market fundamentalism, to put it simply and bluntly, uh, is that it's disastrous for the population, and it never works out very well. Um, I mean, you 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 get uh, an awful lot of incoming and outgoing foreign capital, you get massive increases in inequality, and in many parts of the world you get no growth. It depends on uh, circumstances there. And I am quite struck by the way the sort of free market business went with claims about democracy. I think now, if I see correctly, that the attitude is changing, but the, in Europe I notice in Italy, I notice, for example, that the folks who favor, let us say, strong free market, what I call free market fundamentalist positions, complete the right labor market deregulation and things like that, those folks also, they often campaign against many of the subsidies for political parties that are in laws in Europe. And I think this business is pretty tricky. In particular, a position that I think is a disaster is if you're going to have democratic elections, you need a device to pay for politics that doesn't pay. And if you simply abolish, for instance, state subsidies for parties, I like public financing of elections a lot. I think the candidates should have to show some support, but then I make it pretty easy to run if you want. But if you go and abolish all, in other words, if you, if you abolish all state support for parties and things like that, what actually happens is you turn the politicians over to the billionaires. And my reading of what's going on in a lot in Europe, but many of the campaigns uh, which, are, which are against ridiculous subsidies, which I agree, are plenty of them. I mean, it's, it's absurd. Um, the uh, is often read by sort of folks. There, those campaigns are led by folks who are into classical liberalism. I don't think that works very well for humans. In other words, you can overshoot here. You actually need a, a reform of political finance. I, I certainly think existing political parties in Europe, especially, is here. Here, I think some of the European political science works were pretty good. A lot of these folks now live off the state. 
Um, we would prefer them to have to sort of compete for uh, support from the population. That's why I like tax credits. I would give the ordinary human some money they can use off their taxes to political parties of their choice. And boy, would that move political parties around uh, in a hurry. Um, and I just transformed, maybe transformed your question. Just tell me if I got somewhere near what your point was or not. I mean, I'm perfectly happy to discuss this. Yeah, my, my, like, I, I believe that Italy would have done it better if they stand alone without joining the EU. <coughs> In that example, I am trying to say convergence is not is not the solution here in, in this model. I think it's look, uh, to look at the transaction costs. Which model works for you to create you to be famous or to get into the political position? Which sometimes standing alone is better. Like for me in the African situation, I would always prefer to start alone than entering into a coalition and later losing and you know you know losing your reputation forever. Yeah. Okay, let me, here I think maybe there is a, perhaps, might be a misunderstanding on convergence. All convergence means, in the way I was discussing it, was the parties converge on what's politically popular. I don't mean to be saying they do the right thing. I mean, you know, if, if the popular view is wrong, take the case of the EU, just the one you just did. If you think, I mean, I think the EU was deeply flawed, uh, the euro, more precisely, the Eurozone was a deeply flawed instrument from the beginning. It's an almost, it's a machine built for destruction um, because it lacks the recycling capabilities of central economic governance and investment stuff that uh, a monetary union just has to require. Um, and it lacks, as everyone now has sort of realized, the sort of group shared uh, commitment to things like bank inspection and mutualized liabilities, in other words, your own bonds, um, that, uh, that, that monetary means just have to have. Um, but, you know, the population, I mean, there's no question, I think, that in the early polling, most of the Southern Europe thought the Euro was going to be great for us. Often, not so much, they didn't have much of a clear understanding of, I think, the economic benefits as much as they wanted their own local elites to have to conform to European standards for transparency. Now, those have not turned out in the crunch to be so great either. But all I mean by convergence is I want you to see the strength of these models in where, the, you know, you, as, we, as we sort of walk through that Downs point, the, the parties have to give the public what, uh, not necessarily, something like, they have to give them that median point, which isn't what everybody wants, but it's like the, at the point closest to <coughs> most of them uh, are sitting around. Um, and that really is forced by the logic of the competition. If, if the population is wrong about what it's for its welfare, then that convergence is disastrous. I mean, it's, I'm not talking about the convergence that the European Union talks about when they want to sort of in their, what, I mean, the European Union has gradually become a super national form of governance, especially since about 2011 or 2012. Um, it's no, you, you wouldn't any longer treat it, I think, as simply an intergovernmental set of deals or something like that. That's another debate. Um, and when they talk about convergence, they have a very clear sort of uh, ultra free market economy meaning of that in mind. I'm not, I'm not here to tell you that's good for anybody. I, I'm just talking about if there's a political view and people have it under some conditions you can get it in these classical democratic models, but if you alter those conditions just a little, you don't get it and something else really, uh, a different dynamic takes hold. Yes? I'm not quite sure that convergence is always the real solution, because also what matters for a political party is also coherence. So if, if you just follow the popular view, you might be un not coherent with your previous positions. Yep. So you might not be very <laughs> We need to. Yeah. This is the whims of the public model. 
right. which is real deep in a lot of political traditions. In other words, you could be the ultimate one, I guess, but Plato and the Republic, you know, where yeah. the population yeah. is the great beast um, there. And I, I have two points about this. One is, we're right now, my defense on this, I'm not advocate, I mean, I don't think the Downsian model applies to much in the real world. Uh, this is not, I mean, effectively, what I'm really telling you is real political dynamics don't come out of following the popular will. Um, so that's a little bit sort of unfair to say. <laughs> no, uh, let's, let, there's no reason to get excited about the public having whims. Your rulers have whims. The prince has whims, if you'd like, uh, if I were going to use the Machiavelli term uh, there. Um, there is some discussion of this. Ben Page, uh, as a, a friend of mine who does American political science, has looked at public opinion on this and tried to sort of guess if you actually have empirical data, which is a problem, because people don't poll on everything. They only poll on a subset of issues. Um, if you do that, you don't find the public bouncing all over the place. Politicians and people who uh, often use that as a rhetoric uh, but that's the claim is that's not nearly as common as people think. So I'm sort of saying, I guess, first of all, the convergence model in the Downsian thing is just there as a model of how things might happen. It doesn't happen much. And then the other one is maybe empirically the situation is not as terrible as you say. Um, for sure, I mean, there's been a long tra conservative tradition, deeply suspicious of popular governments, precisely, I mean, Plato being the first, right, but there are plenty more, you know, Delaster and lots of other folks who just think you just can't trust the population. Um, my guess is, I, I'm, where I come out on this is still the, the Winston Churchill position that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. I mean, that is to say, I, I, I don't really find a rule by princes or, you know, generals and juntas. Now, we, it does seem that we are on the cusp of a new era of third world authoritarians. You can see, you name it, Thailand, uh, various parts of the Middle East, they're getting these strong men. Yeah, I should say there doesn't. Right in the current crop, there don't seem to be any strong women, but there on occasion you have them running countries. Um, that's changing, that, but that's my plea is that's to some extent a different discussion right now. But I got, I'm actually, um, yes, I'll tell you, I'm happy to take five questions. I don't know if you have to ask people, but I have two questions mm -hmm. uh, back in the brief. The first question that you mentioned about the campaign in Boston. <coughs> Yep. Um, because it's a starting point, I think campaign cost. But also there is another important point that is the voting process, the calculate the calculation of votes is also very important because the mechanism actually influences the campaign cost. Well, I, th I think the, the can I just on that one? Yes. Um, this is the first question. I